Dr. Sonia Kluger is a self-proclaimed vulturephile and South Africa's leading expert on our vultures. In particular, she's focused on the bearded vulture, which she has been monitoring and researching um, since 2000 in Southern Africa. She obtained her doctorate in 2014 through the Percy Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology at the University of Cape Town, investigating the decline of the bearded vulture in Southern Africa. Sonia represents his Mbelo in Wildlife in facilitating the implementation of the bearded vulture biodiversity management plan and coordinates the bilateral bearded vulture recovery program. Tonight she's delivering a pre-recorded presentation, but I'm going to give her a chance now, Sonia, if you'd like to unmute yourself and turn on your video, just to say hi to everyone before we get to that, uh, to that video. So Sonia, over to you for a few words before we get going. Thanks very much, Andrew. And yeah. Very happy to be here this evening and join you all. And it's also fantastic to see so many of you have seen bearded vultures in the wild already. So they will be nothing new to you. And also great to see so many people joining from right around the world and around Africa. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sonia. It's great to have you with us. Thanks for going through and pre-recording this presentation for us. So in case anything does go wrong, we do, uh, we do at least know that we have this in the backup. Um, there is a chance at the end to ask um, some questions of Sonia. She will be with us live. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to your presentation. So thank you. I'm going to share my screen now with your video. And hopefully everything goes just fine. Here we go. Good evening and thank you for joining me. It is a pleasure to share with you some of the research and conservation work of the Bearded Vulture Recovery Program. This webinar will synthesize 20 years of research and monitoring of the critically endangered bearded vulture population in Southern Africa, where we aimed at determining why the population is declining and then providing the necessary information to guide the conservation of the species. Vultures are one of the fastest declining groups of birds globally. Populations across Africa have also undergone massive declines, with some populations restricted only to protected areas. Similarly, the Southern African bearded vulture population has declined by more than 30%. Vultures provide important ecosystem services and key ecological functions. Therefore, we need to manage populations to reduce their extinction risk. And in order to do this, we need to understand the causes of decline of these populations. For the past 20 years, we've been undertaking research and monitoring to try and determine what the population trend is, determine what's driving this trend, identify key interventions to try and stop the decline in the population, as well as assess the effectiveness of some of these interventions. For those of you that aren't familiar with the species, the bearded vulture is a large raptor that stands up over a meter high, weighs anything up to six kilograms, and has a massive wingspan of over two and a half meters wide. They are monogamous birds. They pair for life and they nest on cliffs in potholes at altitudes of over 1800 meters. They are obligate scavengers which means that they only feed on carcasses. They do not hunt any of their own food and their diet consists primarily of bones, which they often drop from great heights to splinter into small pieces that they are then able to swallow. The threats that were identified for the species in the past included poisoning, habitat degradation, disturbance of their breeding sites and collisions with power lines. Globally, the bearded vulture is classified as near threatened. The estimate of the global population is anything between two to 10,000 individuals, which translates to almost one and a half to six and a half thousand adults in the population. And you can see they are distributed across Africa, Europe, and Asia, with the red populations indicating those that have gone extinct. Locally, we have a subspecies called Gypetes barbatus meridionalis, and it is an isolated population in southern Africa 
which has decreased more than 38% in its range, previously having occurred in the Western and the Eastern Cape, but is now limited very much to the Maluti Drakensberg Mountains. The regional estimate in Southern Africa is between 305 and 382 individuals, which is 191 to 239 mature individuals or adults. In terms of the history of the species, a lot of research and monitoring was undertaken by Christopher Brown for his PhD in the 1980s, but very little was done in the following 20 years. From the year 2000, the work on the species gained momentum, with the Bearded Vulture Task Force being established in 2006. This task force developed a conservation management plan for the species, which was then revised in 2011 and gazetted as the Biodiversity Management Plan in South African legislation. In 2020, the Bearded Vulture Task Force again revised the plan and developed a bilateral recovery strategy and action plan for the species in both Lesotho and South Africa. In 2006, a workshop was held to project what the population trend would be in the future. The result was quite dire. We established that the population had 89% chance of extinction within the next 50 years. This projection was based on the best in available information at the time, but it was clear that we needed more up-to-date information on the population. So firstly, we needed to determine the population size of the species. How many breeding pairs were there in the population in the Maluti Drakensberg Mountains of Lesotho in South Africa? We were lucky enough to be able to survey by helicopter when funding was available and count breeding pairs in potholes along the, the cliffs. But for the most part, surveys were done on foot with many hours spent surveying the cliffs with spotting scopes to determine any breeding activity. The surveys revealed that the number of breeding pairs had declined by more than 30% and only 57% of all territories were actually occupied by birds. In addition, the breeding range reduced by 27%, resulting in an overall population size of less than 400 individuals. And if you look at the map on your right, you'll see Lesotho in the middle with the dark circles representing bearded vulture territories that were known by researchers in the past, and the open circles are those territories which we found as part of our surveys over the past few decades. The crosses indicate territories that on the periphery of the range that have been abandoned by the species in the past few decades. So why have so many of these breeding territories been abandoned? There are three possible reasons, one being human impacts, the density of power lines or settlements or roads within their range, a possible lack of food, and we looked at the presence of livestock or wild ungulates and the density of supplementary feeding sites to corroborate the statement. And then finally looked at climate change because the predictions for South Africa are for temperatures to be increasing, which means that the birds do not have an option of retreating to colder climates because they are already in the highest, coldest parts of the country. The research results showed that territories were more likely to have been abandoned if they had more power lines and higher densities of human settlements within them. And this is shown by the large difference between the dark gray and the light gray bars in the first two variables, the power lines and the settlements, whereas the difference between the two bars, the two different colored bars, is very slight for the other variables. And similar results were found by a student last year, Imtias Abuz at UCT, who also found that breeding adults preferred grassland and avoided built-up areas. Now that we had a better understanding of what caused birds to abandon their territories, we wanted to know if similar threats were also resulting in the mortalities of these birds. We knew that poisoning and collisions with power lines and habitat disturbance were 
threats identified in the past, and we were interested to know if these were still current threats threatening the population. In order to determine the causes of mortality, we used the data from birds that were found dead over the past 20 years, which was 12 individuals, as well as 13 tracked birds that were found dead during the same period. We tested the blood of six individuals and the bone samples of eight individuals for lead, which we know has an impact on other raptor species, and we were interested to see if this was also a threat to the bearded vulture. So we found that poisoning was by far the greatest threat to the species, and together with persecution and power lines, it shows that human impacts account for more than three quarters of the deaths of bearded vultures. In terms of the lead results, the blood lead levels showed very low levels of exposure to lead, and blood is an indication of recent exposure of the individual to lead. Bone, on the other hand, indicates long-term exposure and levels of over between 10 and 20 show that the bird has been exposed to lead and that is certainly a concern for the population. So we assumed that the high mortality rates were driving the population decline, but it was also important to look at the productivity of the population to determine whether this was also a factor in the declining trend. To do this, we surveyed breeding territories at the beginning of the breeding season to see how many pairs attempted to breed, and then we checked them again at the end of the season to see how many of these attempts were successful. We found that over half of the pairs attempted to breed every year, and about three quarters of these pairs were successful. And this translated to 0.4 young being produced per pair per year. So essentially each pair produces a chick every second year. So this species does lay two eggs, but they're only ever able to raise one chick, although the data suggests that they're only raising a chick every second year, which can certainly be contributing to the population decline. We are not sure whether the low productivity is due to food limitation or due to the high adult mortality rates. In order to address the food limitation, we can try and provide food during critical periods in the breeding season. We can provide food to adults in the pre-egg laying period and to the chicks during the fledging period to try and give them every chance of success. And that is where supplementary feeding sites like the one shown in the picture here are really valuable to the population. As you can see, a lot of immatures in the foreground and a couple of adults in the background. We also needed to study the movements of the birds in order to target our management actions in the areas that are most intensively used by individuals. In order to do this, we fitted satellite transmitters to 25 individuals across five different age classes. One of, what, of these transmitters is still functioning today. We started in 2009 and caught these individuals at feeding sites and at the same time as fitting transmitters, we took various measurements and took blood samples as well for testing. The home range sizes of bearded vultures increase as they get older and explore a greater part of their range. The home range covered about 65% of the total range of the species which is an area of 30,000 square kilometers. Adult home ranges, on the other hand, were very small by comparison and only about 1% of the size of the non-adults. And especially the breeding adults had really small home ranges. And although these didn't differ very much between the breeding and the non-breeding season, they did use their home ranges more intensively during the breeding season. But these small circles represent home range sizes of various individual adults that were tracked. This map shows the movements in the past week of Molly, our remaining tracked bearded vulture that has been tracked since 2011 until present, which is over 10 years already. And this individual is breeding and foraging in a really small area around the central Drakensberg. 
we know that non-adult birds range far and wide, so we were interested to know which particular age class was most at risk. The risks that were considered were the density of human settlements, power lines and roads, and the benefits to the birds that were looked at were the percentage of protected land and the number and density of feeding sites. We found that non-adult birds between four and six years of age faced the greatest exposure to risks due to their larger home range size compared with the ad other age classes. But they also benefited by having better access to more feeding sites because of the use of their range. And here I'd like to share with you a fantastic resource which has recently become available to assist us in the monitoring and aging of bearded vultures. And we will share the link with you after the presentation for you to be able to download and use this resource yourself. One of the proactive conservation measures that have been undertaken is the development of habitat use models that can be used as a planning tool to mitigate developments, such as the placement of wind farms or power lines and other infrastructure in the range of the species. We found that bearded vultures spent the majority of their time flying in areas that are typically chosen for wind farm developments, the high wind areas, and they generally fly at heights within the rotor sweep of the turbines, which makes them vulnerable to collisions. Therefore, even small scale wind farm developments could cause regional extinctions in the population. And if you look at the habitat use map of the birds over here along the KwaZulu Natal Drakensberg escarpment in the green is where the highest density of the birds is down towards the Eastern Cape, but this is also the area that has the highest wind resource. But is a very useful tool to, for consultants to plan uh, proper placement of wind turbines. The information presented thus far has been used to guide the management of the bearded vulture population and the development of conservation actions for the species across its range. Firstly, I'd like to share with you the goals and the targets of the bilateral bearded vulture recovery strategy and action plan, which is what we are using uh, to manage the population. Our first goal is to reduce the population decline and stabilize it at 100 breeding pairs over the next five years, so between 20 and 2025. We then want to grow the population to 150 breeding pairs over the next 50 years and then maintain this positive growth rate. So with this in mind, we want to obviously see how viable the population is currently, what is the extinction risk and how do we best address this. So we previously looked at this extinction risk in 2006 and hot off the press, we held a workshop last week to relook at the extinction risk of the species using population viability analyses. And this was a workshop that was facilitated by the IUCN Species Survival Commission's Conservation Planning Specialist Group. So an independent facilitation of determining the viability of the population. The first step of the workshop was to develop fundamental objectives of what we wanted to achieve in the population. And these were prioritized as firstly, maximizing the growth rate of the population in the wild, securing as much of the genetic diversity from the existing population as possible, minimizing the cost of any of these actions and maximizing the range of the species. This graph presents the current situation of the population trend in the next 50 years. Basically, the population continues to decline without any additional actions being undertaken by conservationists, resulting in only 65 birds being less left in the population in the next 50 years, which translates to about 20 pairs. So in order to prevent extinction or to try and increase the population, we need to reduce the deaths in the wild, increase the number of females that breed, increase the number of chicks that survive, 
and harvest eggs from the wild population to build a captive flock that is large enough to conserve the genetic diversity of the wild population, as well as produce chicks for release back into the existing wild population. The blue line on the graph in front of you is showing an increasing trend, which is something that we would achieve in the wild population if we reduced mortalities, increased productivity, and supplemented the wild population with birds from captivity. In order to achieve the supplementation of the population, we established a bearded vulture breeding program that is managed by Shannon Hoffman at the Birds of Prey Sanctuary. The aim of the captive breeding program is twofold. Firstly, a genetic insurance in case the population goes extinct in the wild, and it also allows for the breeding of the captive birds and reintroductions to reduce the extinction risk. The aim of the program, which was established in 2015, was to harvest five second eggs from the wild for six years to achieve a captive population of 30 individuals. In reality, only 14 birds are in captivity after harvesting has taken place for seven years. The progress has been slow due to limited resources, extreme weather during the time of harvesting, a large number of infertile second eggs in the wild population, the nest accessibility, the travel across borders, and the harvest protocol which has been restricted to harvesting only the second eggs. Some of the nest accessibility challenges are shown in these photographs here, as well as some extreme and unexpected challenges which resulted in no eggs harvested that particular year. Fortunately, the challenges are forgotten when you watch a chick hatch in captivity and being fed by the puppet and reared successfully. So in summary, and in terms of the way forward, what we need to do is implement the species management plan. This means improved law enforcement throughout the range, addressing the impacts of poisoning, which is by far the biggest threat to the species. We need to implement a power line mitigation strategy that's both proactively and reactively, and try and protect territories and pairs and provide supplementary food to breeding birds. We need to grow the captive population to 32 individuals to allow for supplementation of the wild. And we need to try and increase public awareness at all levels of society so that people know the plight of the species. In conclusion, the 20 years of research on the bearded vulture population of Southern Africa has enabled us to document its status and distribution and understand the factors limiting population growth, the movement of the birds, and the genetic diversity. Recommendations for urgent intervention in priority areas can now be made to enable conservation action to be more focused and more effective and to improve the status of the species and gain support for its conservation amongst a host of other priorities and other priority species. The research enables conservationists to focus their interventions on specific issues and locations that will have the highest impact. It also adds value to various vulture management strategies at a time when vulture population declines are increasingly being recognized as one of the most pressing issues in avian conservation globally and in Africa in particular. At this stage, you may be asking yourself, how can you help the project or the species? I think one of the most important things one can do is to raise awareness amongst the public on the plight of the species and to try and gain people's support, as well as supporting various fundraising initiatives, both in Lesotho and South Africa. Report sightings of any marked birds that you may see, such as those with transmitters or patagial wing tags or leg rings. Report any illegal activities or mortalities throughout the region. And report any sites where you suspect the birds may be nesting. And hopefully our awareness and conservation efforts will ensure that sufficient birds remain for future generations to enjoy.
And I'd like to end by thanking the various individuals and organizations that have been involved in the conservation of the species and those that have funded the various projects of the Bearded Vulture Recovery Program. Thank you so much, Sonia, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I can still remember very, very clearly my first uh, bearded vulture sighting at the, the Hyde at Golden Gate National Park. And it was honestly one of the, the biggest thrills of my birding career or birding life to date, just seeing this magnificent creature uh, come over in, in the, the upper Drakensberg and its dramatic surroundings. and. It's very clear that it's a species close to many of our hearts and um, clearly it's in a very, very bad way, but we are also very grateful to have people like yourself and various groups and other um, conservationists working towards um, rescuing the species and arresting their decline. So thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and uh, show us your, your video again. We're going to get into some questions very shortly. If you do have any questions, you can pop these in the Q&A box for Sonia. Do come back next week um, for the next in our AV Tourism series. We have uh, Nikki Forbes or Nicolette Forbes from BirdLife Life Queenie Queenie KZN and she's going to be talking about the excellent birding to be had around Durban and the surrounds. So uh, thanks to Nikki for continuing that very popular series. But for now, Sonia, we're going to get on to some questions if you're ready. Um, what should we start with? Uh, let's start with a question from Penny Abbott. Um, Penny would like to know, do we know whether our population's breeding success is similar to other populations? Um, do we have comparisons between, for example, the European population and the Southern African population? What might the, the consequences or, or uh, the takeouts for, for that be? So yes, uh, the breeding, we do have breeding success figures from around the world actually. Um, a lot of the European populations have done similar work and we found that a few populations are doing a lot worse than our population. Uh, they've got breeding success of even between one and two individual, oh, 0.1 individuals uh, per pair per year. So that's in, in a insular population on Corsica, so that's a small island population that's declining. Some of the populations in the Pyrenees have been doing very well and they up to 0.6 uh, individuals per pair per year. So you can see that our figure fits in the middle of those two and there's quite a few figures that range between 0.3, 0.5. I think probably the highest uh, globally is 0.8. So even though we, we think ours is quite low, it is pretty much in the middle or one in similar to the averages globally. Okay, thank you for that. There's quite a few questions here about poisoning. So I'm just gonna group them and they, they're centering around, uh, you're just elaborating a bit on, on what poisons, but also what can be done to, to prevent or mitigate this threat specifically. Yeah, it's certainly our, our biggest concern and needs the most concerted effort. Uh, what we are doing currently is a lot of uh, poison prevention training. Uh, in terms of uh, the human wildlife conflict management, looking at options other than poisoning and also looking at uh, reacting to poisoning incidents uh, a lot quicker and more efficiently in terms of uh, dealing with the wildlife crime scene to try and also save any birds that might, uh, might not have died yet of the poisoning uh, incident. Because normally at a carcass you'd see well, dozens or even hundreds of vultures. So the quicker you can deal with the, the scene, the better. So there is a lot of training uh, happening on that front. And also just environmental awareness and education right throughout the range, because there are still some individuals that think bearded vultures catch lambs and are therefore poisoning uh, the birds to try and um, prevent livestock losses. So that's, that's something that can be dealt with with education. But our efforts definitely need to be ramped up a notch uh, just to try and stop that, the decline of the birds. There would be no point in supplementing the population uh, with birds from captivity if all these threats are still very prevalent in the population. 
So there was a question around, is the poisoning incidental or, or directed? Um, and you mentioned their uh, persecution because they are seen as um, predating on, on livestock, particularly lambs. But um, what, what is the majority of the poisoning events? Are they just incidental or are they targeted at vultures specifically? So the majority is incidental poisoning events. It's uh, people poisoning live uh, carnivores that kill livestock and the bearded vultures are, are just a secondary poisoning. But there is some persecution of the species uh, where, where the nests aren't wanted in the community areas and people are stoning the birds, um, throwing stones on the eggs or trying to chase the birds away to keep them away from their livestock. So that that's definitely is a concern. And we've heard more recently that um, the birds are also being used as food and obviously also in the muti trade. Um, so traditional medicine is using all the different vulture species, so not only the bearded vulture. Okay, yeah, that, that is very concerning. Um, there's a couple of people also asking about the bilateral efforts between Lesotho and South Africa. If you can just talk to the enthusiasm and the involvement of your uh, colleagues in Lesotho and the Lesotho authorities around this issue. Yes, so the, we have a bearded vulture task force that I mentioned in the presentation. This is a bilateral group and basically consists of individuals from all the conservation organizations in South Africa in the range of the species in the Free State, the KwaZulu Natal and the Eastern Cape. And it also includes people from the ministry in Lesotho and volunteers that do monitoring for us in Lesotho as well as community members and uh, local chiefs. And yeah, that group meets twice a year, but we are in regular contact throughout the year. And we also assist both in, you know, both sides of the border to react to certain incidences. If we do have mortalities of birds uh, to try and assist and get birds across the border to rehabilitation facilities, if that's the case. And certainly a lot of awareness um, cross-cutting across the border as well as the monitoring and we are harvesting eggs in both countries. So there's definitely collaboration in those type of activities. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. Um, there was a question around muti trade and whether the superstitions around, uh, for instance, eating vultures eyes and having incredible foresight are playing into bearded vultures at all. Uh, yes, they are. So they don't seem to dis, uh, particularly aim at any vulture species. Fortunately for the bearded vulture, they don't really look like your average vulture. They look more like an eagle. So people might not know that they're vultures and therefore they don't necessarily target the bearded vulture. And they also at very low numbers in the population in general. So you don't find them in high numbers in the Muti markets, although we do see them. It's just uh, they're not that uh, frequently encountered. But we do know it's, it is definitely a concern. And birds are sold even in Maputo and Johannesburg that have come from the Drakensberg or the Maluti Mountains. So they that's are traveling far and wide. That's quite incredible after seeing those photographs of people having to abseil down to nests and, and seeing what <laughs> lengths you have to go to to actually get your hands on, on eggs, for instance. Um, yeah, that is concerning. Yeah, I've tried to catch many birds and it's, it's really a difficult exercise. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm quite surprised that people do manage to, to get hold of so many birds illegally. Um, Penny Abbott again would like to know whether it's possible to go and visit the captive breeding program at the Birds of Prey Centre. Yes, so the African Birds of Prey Sanctuary is just outside Peter Maritzburg. It's between Peter Maritzburg and Durban. They, the facility is open to the public and people will be able to see the bearded vultures. So I would actually encourage everyone to go and visit if, if they are heading on the N3 between Peter Maritzburg and Durban. It's, it's well worth seeing. We are starting a new breeding facility that will just be dedicated uh, to breeding pairs that won't, uh, which don't need or don't, that ideally don't want to be disturbed um, by the public, but there will certainly still be birds on display for the public at the centre. Okay. And another question linked to breeding in captivity. Um, Alan Bedford Shaw would like to know, does the population in captivity manage acceptably? And do they breed in captivity, which you've alluded to the fact that they do? 
And at what point would it be viable to introduce captive bred, bred vultures back into the wild? Okay, so the, as I mentioned, the captive population is 14 individuals and it's a population that was started in 2014. So the birds take about at least seven years to mature and start breeding, well, in the wild or in captivity. So it's a very long process to start getting um, chicks in the captive population. So the pairs that we have at the moment are, are just starting to pair. It's the first birds that were harvested in 2015 are now old enough to start breeding. So this is the first year that they are pairing and they're actually building a nest at the moment with material that's been put in their cage. So that's really, really encouraging to see. And we may get lucky this year with an egg laying. Otherwise, certainly from next year onwards, we can expect uh, some eggs to be laid in the captive population. And then we need to start planning on where to introduce those birds into the wild. But at the moment, we've just been building the captive flock to that uh, target of 30 individuals. Yeah, that's, that's uh, great. And we're all holding thumbs that that uh, becomes a productive input into the population. There's a question from uh, Thomas van Fieken, and Thomas would like to know what are the impacts of wind turbines, and is there an industry statement which states that the impact is successfully mitigated by painting one of the blades black? Do you have any observations around that? So fortunately, we don't have any wind farms in the range of the bearded vulture yet. Uh, certainly, the Cape vulture is experiencing impacts with wind farms. We've had some applications for wind farms in the range, which we've uh, managed to, to stop the development of those, and we'll, we'll certainly try and continue that um, going forward. And yeah, the foraging nature of the birds is that they look down when they forage, they don't look ahead of them, and that's why they do collide with things like power lines or cables or, or wind turbine blades. So it is something we're very concerned about, uh, and painting blades, at the moment, as far as I understand, in South Africa, it's it's not allowed, but uh, it is also not hasn't been shown to be effective uh, to try and make them more visible. But that's mainly because of the way that uh, vultures forage, and that's why they're not seeing the blades. Okay. But it, it's Thank definitely you. a threat that that is going to be with us for a very long time. Okay. Well, I hope we're well guided by the. The, the management guidelines for other birds of prey um, when it comes to that threat being realized. There is a question from Rob Simmons, who I'm sure you know. Uh, Rob wants to know the, whether or not the infertile eggs may be due to the smaller size of second eggs. And uh, have you done any measurements comparing the first laid eggs with the second eggs? Yes, so the second eggs are definitely a little bit smaller than, than the first laid eggs, and that's how we can tell the difference uh, when collecting the second egg in the wild. Uh, we do take calipers and measure them in the wild and then take, take the smaller second egg. So we have had a nest with three eggs in it even, and, and there's a number of nests that just have one egg as well. So the infertility the pair has been infertile, has had an infertile egg in the one year, and in the following year, the eggs are fertile again. So it does seem to be a bit of variation, but we also have a very small sample size of nests that we've climbed to, so it's probably about 28 or so nests. So that's information that we're gathering as the harvesting program continues. Well, thanks for that. And another one from Rob. I'll give him a significant amount of floor time tonight. Um, he wants to know whether or not there's a plan to increase genetic diversity and will this involve eggs or birds from the uh, more northern populations? So yes, certainly genetic diversity is something we're concerned about. Our population is very small. It's been isolated for a very long time and with very little connectivity to other populations. And the diversity is low, so we would need to certainly keep uh, re- introducing birds into the captive uh, population from the wild population on a regular basis just to keep that diversity going. Uh, we haven't considered introducing birds from, for example, Ethiopia, which would be our, our next closest source uh, of the same subspecies at least. So that is certainly a consideration for the future. But we also have found that our population has some very special genes uh, 
that aren't shown in any other populations. And that's certainly something we would want to preserve going forward. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's a question here from Arun Elner, and I think Arun must follow your project quite closely. Uh, he says, your monthly update on the bearded vultures in the Drakensberg and the Situ shows a gradual decline of birds being monitored with satellite tracking devices. Are you planning to do future satellite tracking and potential tagging on the vultures? Um, and he says, thank you so much for an excellent presentation and many years of dedication. Thank you. So yes, we've had uh, 25 birds that we've been tracking over the years. So unfortunately, a lot of them have already died and a few of them have dropped their transmitters and we are left with just that one individual. So we have got a wealth of information of those trackers, which have been transmitting for more than uh, 10 years. And I think that's probably well over 300 bird years of information that we've got. And it's that information that we've been using to look at the movements, uh, patterns, and uh, try and develop all these habitat use models to try and inform developments and assist with conservation planning. So we have a, a wealth of information. So at the moment, there wouldn't be any need to put additional tracking devices on. It's also a very expensive exercise to try and pay for these transmitters. But certainly, once we start introducing birds into the wild from the captive population, we would want to be tracking the progress of those birds to make sure that those reintroductions are successful. So it's definitely something we would consider again at that stage, yes. Um, getting back to the uh, captive bred populations, Marty Jasper wants to know whether or not artificial insemination has been considered as something to do as opposed to having um, mating of actual live vultures? So it is something we have considered, but we haven't taken that thought any further, but it's, it's certainly something that would need some more discussion going forward, yes. It may end up being the last resort in some, uh, certainly in some cases, uh, so it's not something we want to discard at all. Okay. Then there's a couple of questions around vulture restaurants, which you mentioned in the talk. And you mentioned that there are quite a few of these around. The first question is, um, which of these can be visited by the public? And the second question is related to vulture restaurants leading to a decrease in range. And what are the mechanisms and problems associated with that? Okay, so yes, there are a number of, of vulture restaurants right throughout the range. We have done a study on the restaurants to try and get a database of where they all are, how frequently they, they provision food, and also the attitudes of, of the managers. Are they aware of the various threats to vultures, such as veterinary drugs or, or lead from um, bullets that are used to cull or kill the animals? So we, we do try and get a handle on the management of these sites. And it is also an activity that we do encourage right throughout the range to try and increase the food source for the birds. Because of the large amount of land transformation, the, there's certainly not as much livestock in the areas as before. So supplementary feeding sites are encouraged. Uh, it doesn't look like the birds are reliant on those sites solely. They, they're not sitting you know, on the cliffs waiting, waiting for food to be put at the site. So at the moment, it doesn't seem to be affecting the behave, their natural behave, feeding behavior uh, in, in the wild. But it, it's something we do need to manage and also look at where the gaps are in feeding sites in the landscape and possibly start new feeding sites because we do think it will increase productivity in the species. It has been something that's been tried in Spain and it did increase productivity of the population, but it also resulted in the productivity declining over time because the juveniles would be competing with the adults at feeding sites that were placed quite close to the nests. So that is also something that we need to uh, be well aware of and not impact the adults negatively. Are there any concerns about vulture restaurants um, being the points of aggregations that they are having a uh, high risk for, for poisoning events and persecution events as well? Yes, that's certainly something we are aware of and we, we need to try and, and manage and mitigate. As soon as people know that that is a site where vultures are feeding regularly, it is something that, that can become a risk. So we do need to be well aware of it. And sorry, just to get back to the, the previous question, which restaurants uh, people can visit. 
There are, I think everyone's familiar with the Giant Castle um, feeding site and Hyde, as well as the Golden Gate one. Uh, so there are a couple of uh, restaurants in protected areas. And perhaps just look at the Project Vulture website uh, for more information on which feeding sites can be visited. There are a number on private properties uh, where farmers have just been putting out carcasses, so those not, aren't necessarily open to the public, but there's certainly quite a few that people can visit. And it right. is a great way right. to see the birds, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Taylor would like to know what are the subspecies diagnostic features um, for our population of bearded vultures? So owls are definitely prettier, <laughs> better looking. So the, the owl subspecies are slightly smaller than the European um, or the Northern subspecies. And owls have a very, the most diagnostic feature probably is the very white head of the species. Whereas the, the Northern species has more black lines in the head and black ear tufts. So there, there are some black streaks and there's also a very dark color on the chest of the northern species, which isn't on the southern species. Interesting. Okay. Um, is it true that um, some of that red coloring is actually more related to dust than the plumage or is that uh, a legend? So the red coloring, so the birds actually aren't red or orange at all or ochre colored. They are snow white. Uh, their chests are snow white. And even the youngsters, um, although their feathers are brown, you often do see that, that slightly orange colouring. And that is from bathing in muddy rock pools in the Drakensberg, where there's a rich iron content in the rocks. So if birds are in captivity for a very long time and don't have any access to the mud, they actually are snow white um, on their chest. It's just through the mud baths that they do get that colour. And yeah, when captive birds are given mud, they, they really enjoy the mud baths. It takes them literally a few seconds to get straight into that. So it's, it's something they really enjoy. And sometimes at the feeding sites, you can see a, a bird that's, that's just had a mud bath and is really wet um, on, its, on its chest coming to, coming to feed at a site. And that doesn't impede their flight feathers at all? Uh, not at all, no. It's, it's mainly the chest feathers that, that they're using to bath. Um, and they, they stick the wings out behind them while they, they rub their chests in the, in the mud bath. That's fascinating. I definitely learned something there. Um, Salisha Chandra would like to know, what is the, the risk and the, the timeline for climate change affecting that uh, habitat range or breeding behavior or other aspects of the species? So that's something we still need to do a lot more work on, but it is something we are concerned about because they really have a, a very small range and are restricted to the high altitudes and the coldest parts of the country. So there really is nowhere else for them to go. And with all the developments uh, of settlements and infrastructure in their range, it's just further restricting them to, to the high mountain areas. So that's something we need to do more work on. Uh, but we do know that they, they can perhaps change the aspect of their nest to have the aspect in a more, the southern slopes, the more cooler side. So that, that would be one way of trying to mitigate. If they can't go higher, they can certainly try and nest where it's, it's cooler. But uh, certainly more work needs to be done on that. All right, and I see we're closing in very quickly on eight o'clock when your load shedding is scheduled to kick in. So I'm gonna take one more question here um, from, Lynette Rudman, um, and for a bit of context for those of you who don't know, uh, there was a recent um, crisis of Asian vultures where veterinary drugs were found to be to blame. So, so Lynette has asked, um, what about in Southern Africa, carcasses of animals that have died after being dosed with medicines that could harm them? Is that a problem? Yes, definitely a problem. So the Asian problem was uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And that is something that, that is a concern in Southern Africa as well. Uh, we're well aware of it. The vets are well aware of it as well. And any carcasses that are fed at feeding sites or that are collected from farmers to put at feeding sites, we always check that, that they haven't been treated with anything that will harm vultures. And we try and provide information to farmers that they're also well aware of, of which products are dangerous for vultures and which aren't. So we haven't at the moment tested any birds 
the cause of death hasn't been veterinary drugs in any of the birds that we've been able to test, but uh, we're well aware of it and we're trying to manage that. All right. I'm actually going to take one more just because it's just come in from Rob Simmons while you were answering that. Um, I'm curious to know the answer and I'm in charge so I can ask it. Um, <laughs> Rob's asked, does the dust bathing and, and especially iron oxide have any positive effects for the bird's feathers? or is it more possibly a sexually selected trait? So we don't think it's a sexual selection. We do think it's because of the, they do have a lot of mites uh, on their feathers. And that is one way of trying to just relieve the, the impact of the mites. And funnily enough, they also change nests for the very same reason. The birds have, I've been speaking about territories all evening and they often have several nests in one territory, and you find that the birds might breed in a different nest every year within that same territory. And the reason being is that they store a lot of food in their nests, and there's often um, mites as well, that, that the, the mite load builds up in the nest, and that's why they, they move nests, just to allow that load to go down. And that's also yeah, the reason, main reason why they do a lot of dust bathing. All right, so they're, they're beautiful birds, but not very good at housekeeping. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that, um, on that humorous note, I'm just going to close it off there. There are quite a few questions left. Um, if you would like to, you could type some answers to those um, once we've closed off the webinar. But um, all that remains to be said is thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight. And thank you to you, Sonia, for sharing your time and your expertise around these very uh, threatened but also beautiful and important birds. Thank you for all the work that you do. My pleasure. Thanks.